Good everybody. Welcome to our Bible study. It's earlier than usual because um, I'm pre-recording this so you can either watch it now or tonight. So welcome. Um, this Bible study today is looking at Acts chapter 4 and I'll begin the reading at verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. So welcome to the Bible study. As I said before, um, I'm not available at seven o'clock tonight. Uh, I need to be um, in a meeting. And um, so I'm pre-recording this study. But before we go any further, let's take a moment to pray and ask God to reveal his word to us and grant us understanding of his written word and the word that comes out of that for us today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would, through the power of your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds to understand your word and how that word applies to our lives today. I ask for your honour, for your praise and for your glory. Amen. Well, it seems um, in Acts chapter 2, which describes the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon those first disciples and how um, the, the work of the Holy Spirit gave Peter boldness to preach to the crowd of pilgrims who were gathered in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. And it seems from chapter 2 onwards, there doesn't seem to be a dull moment. And... Um, one thing after the other, we read about how God is working in the lives of those early disciples. But to put it in context, we mustn't assume that everything that we read in the Acts of the Apostles happened in one week. We're talking, this is over several years when we read of all the events. However, we do know that um, in these early chapters in the book of Acts, <coughs> really up until about chapter 8, that the church was mainly in Jerusalem. And then there was a time of persecution and the, there were a lot of the disciples scattered. But it does seem that the core leadership was still in um, Jerusalem on the whole, because in, in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are sent from the church in Antioch over questions about circumcision and questions about kosher food. And so they go to the, the council in Jerusalem to seek their wisdom and their advice. So it's a bit of a mixed picture that we start in Jerusalem, but by the time we get to the end of the Acts of the, the Apostles, the focus is very much on Paul and his journey to Rome. But here, we're still in those early days in chapter 4. And so beginning at verse 23, we read, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It tells us that following the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, that 3,000 were added to the number of disciples on that day, and they, and they were baptised. And then um, the church continues to grow. But there is um, an event that happens in Acts chapter 3. And of course, when I say of course, remember the church is still in Jerusalem. And when people went to pray, there were no church buildings. That They may have been meeting in the upper room as a group of disciples. But that must have become very difficult and um, impractical because now you have 3,000 plus people in the church. And I'm sure the upper room was large, but I'm not sure whether it was that large. So it would seem that the main place of prayer and gathering at this stage would have been the temple courts. I think the upper room would have still been used for, for some gatherings, but I think it's a mixed pattern of where the church was meeting. So because it didn't have um, a fixed abode, if you want to put it that way. And, and all they've known in terms of public gatherings as Jewish believers was when you go to pray, when you're in Jerusalem, and it's the times of set prayer and sacrifices dur during the day, there's morning, there's, there's the, the afternoon and the evening, you go to the temple to pray if you can. And so Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 are on their way to pray. And at a gate, one of the gates at the temple called the Beautiful Gate, there was a man who was crippled. And he's over 40 years of age. And every day, presumably he's carried there and, and he spends the day begging and asking for help. And on this day, when Peter and John go to the temple, he reaches out um, his palms and he asks for arms. <laughs> As a song, as a chorus um, says, he, he held out his um, palms and he asked for arms. And this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then the chorus says, he went walking and leaping and praising God. There was a great miracle that took place. A man who was over 40 years of age, crippled and lame through the power of Jesus, was enabled to walk. And it describes how he went leaping and bouncing in the temple courts. And those who were regular visitors to the temple looked and thought, this is the man. We see him begging every day on the way into the temple and on the way out. He sat there, but he's walking. What's happened? And, and they come running to Peter and John and to the man. And he says, I've, I've been healed. And Peter and John use the occasion to say, don't look at us. There's nothing special about us. The reason that you see this man walking is because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he's been raised from the dead. And upon preaching, Peter and John are arrested and taken to the Jewish leaders and those who govern the temple to explain what's happened. And because it was now late in the day, it says that um, the council couldn't decide what to do with Peter and John. Because they said, look, if, if, if we punish them, there's, there's, there's going to be a riot. Because everybody knows that a miracle has taken place. What should we do with these people? And, and they're held overnight in, in a cell. And then it says the next day that they're warned and they're threatened not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter and John speak with boldness. And it says the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the ruling council, that these men were uneducated, but they took note that they had been with Jesus and they let them go. And as they return to the church, which is praying, it's possibly to the upper room on this occasion. And there's a group of disciples who are praying and worshiping God. And Peter and John join them and say, this is what's happened. We've been released from prison. This is why we were arrested. And they lift their voices then in prayer. Now, the other thing just to note is this. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added to their number. It doesn't say men, women. So 3,000 men and women, presumably, were added to their number. But after the healing of the man by the beautiful gate, it says this. 
in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, when Peter and John explain about the healing in the name of Jesus. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So now we've got 5,000 men. But there were women in the congregation as well. So the number of disciples may have been up to 10,000. We don't know how many women were involved. But if these are men who live in Jerusalem, we can assume their families <clears throat> are included also in, in the believers. So it must have been 5,000 plus. So they've gone from 120 believers at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, and now there are thousands of them, and they're all in Jerusalem. This is a growing church. And it's a growing church that is filled with a passion that these Jewish believers want their fellow Jewish believers, <clears throat> um, their fellow Jews, to become believers in, in Jesus as the Messiah. And that's the purpose for their prayer. <clears throat> when we pray, God hears our prayers. We come to him just as we are. We lay out before him our prayers and our requests and our supplications. And we come before Almighty God and he hears us because he's our Heavenly Father. And we come in the name of Jesus and we know we have direct access because of Jesus into the Father's presence. We have that access. <clears throat> but here's a prayer that's aimed at the name of Jesus being glorified. And that glory of Jesus in turn glorifying the Father. And so there are three aspects of of this 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 prayer and the results of this prayer which are really important when we pray yes we come before almighty god and we lay our requests before him in one sense there are no rules to prayer you know we, we do have a model of a prayer in the lord's prayer but actually jesus says when when you come before your father you know be, be like the widow who wouldn't take no for an answer just ask and seek and knock and just come and don't think if you use lots of words that you're going to get heard by God just come as you are just come to him as your heavenly father but if all of our prayers are for the glory of Jesus and that's our focus I believe our prayers then are pleasing to God because if Jesus is glorified, then that means more people are affected with the good news of the gospel. We do pray for our daily needs, but remember the model of a prayer that Jesus gives us in the Lord's Prayer. First of all, it's our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, uh, revered, honoured be your name. And we must remember that when we pray. Am I praying? And will the thing I'm asking for bring glory to God? Or is it just for me? And when we pray seeking God's glory, we know, I believe, because of the way Jesus prayed and what he taught, that we're bringing pleasure to the Father. Because if he's glorified, that will benefit more and more people. You see, the more, the more we glorify God, the more it benefits other people. God doesn't keep things for himself. God is a God who is generous and everything he has within his, his, his nature and his, his personality, if you want to call it that way, and, and his being is, is, is for the benefit of others. He sends his son for the benefit of us. Jesus comes for the glory of the Father. The Holy Spirit's content to glorify the Father through Jesus. So let's think how is my prayer glorifying God and how is it blessing other people as well so in my notes here I, I've just there, there were a few things which occur to me as I share this passage with you they pray for boldness to share the good news of Jesus and then it says um, the place where they were meeting was shaken and then they spoke the word of God boldly. I don't think that means that there and then they went out and preached. I think the sense in the passage is this, that the prayer to declare the name of Jesus 
to speak the truth with boldness was something that was outworked subsequently and afterwards that they went out and when they preached they did it with boldness because of the power of the holy spirit we look at this and we may say to ourselves how important is it that this prayer ends with a manifestation of the presence of god because it says in verse 31 after they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the holy spirit and spoke the word of god boldly i've got one of the things um i sometimes use is this new international biblical commentary and this is on the acts of the apostles there we are i find this very useful because it's understandable and for me that helps and it's not the end of um, all the information that we can get with background to the acts of the apostles but it's a good starting place and, and, and it's very informative and it corresponds with the new international version of the bible which i i prefer to use and i was reading in in the notes and, and this is what it said about verse 31 and if you want to make a note then please do immediately the place where they were they were meeting was shaken as though by an earthquake a not uncommon sign of god's presence so the earthquake is a sign of god's presence and the references from the scriptures are these acts chapter 16 verse 26 remember when paul and silas are in prison and they're in philippi and it says they're singing praises to god at midnight and it says the prison door there was an earthquake which indicated the presence of god and all the prison doors were flung open it was a sign of the presence of god exodus 19 18 when god manifests his presence on mount sinai psalm 114 verse 7 isaiah chapter 6 verse 4 Ezekiel 38, chapter 38, verse 19. Joel, chapter 3, verse 16. Amos, chapter 9, verse 5. And Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6. Talk about earthquakes and shaking and a manifestation of the presence of Almighty God. So they pray for boldness to preach. They pray for miracles and signs and wonders, but not just for the sake of the miracles and signs and wonders. They pray this so that Jesus will be recognized as the Messiah. And in their prayer, and in the quotation from um, the Psalms of David, they quote from Psalm 2. In Acts chapter 6, at the end of that verse, verse 4, um, chapter 4 verse 26 it says anointed one when David is prophesying about the anointed one to come anointed one is another way of saying the Messiah Messiah comes from a Hebrew word Meshiach which which which, um, which is to do with anointing and it refers to when the priests were anointed when a king was anointed or when a prophet was anointed and, and the impression is of the oil on the head that's, that's dripping down and going into the beard. Not that I've got one, but it talks in the Psalms, you know, about, about the oil dripping down on Aaron's beard. And the idea is that the anointing with the oil is a symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And one would come who was specially anointed of God, who would be later known as the Messiah. And they refer to that in their prayer at the end of verse 27 where it uh, talks about your holy servant jesus whom you anointed they were passionate that people would come to know the messiah in greek christ the anointed one and to do that they prayed for boldness to speak the word of god and to do that, they prayed that God would manifest his presence with signs and wonders 
and miracles and the place was shaken so what's on my heart to share with you is this that one when we pray things are going to happen when we pray that the name of jesus will be honored and glorified mighty things are going to happen and right now as we come out of lockdown slowly whatever that looks like in the days to come more and more people are turning to prayer only the other week on twitter one of the social media um, providers that what was trending was jesus and how people from across different backgrounds were, were crying out for jesus to help them i believe those prayers will be answered and I believe that when we physically come back as a church, we will be a very different church. And I pray, and no pun intended, I pray that we will be more prayerful as a church. And I pray that maybe some of the insanity of rushing around and organizing this and this this service and that service and all the other, that we'll, we'll take this opportunity as we slowly begin to come back together as a church in the weeks and months ahead, that we will be more prayerful and that in a way we, we almost have um a, a blank a blank piece of paper um which i'm trying to find a blank piece of paper you know often um this is what the church has been like here is my example today we've been like that we've been full of words and things that we need to do that's just the words from the order of service for today <clears throat> but maybe here's an opportunity to come before God like this and to say to the Lord before we just revert back to doing things the same old way how is it that your church here at St Thomas's in Blackpool can pray and can worship and do things which glorify the name of Jesus how is it that we as a community <clears throat> can share that Jesus is the anointed one? How is it that we as a community can, can pray and, and say to our Father in heaven, stretch out your hand to perform miracles and signs and wonders? And when we pray that, not just so that we, as it were, can be a church where uh, people say, Oh, there's a church where signs and wonders and miracles are happening. And if we're going to be cynical about it, that that we get tourists <laughs> who, who want to come to see what's happening. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody is welcome at St. Thomas's. But I think if we want to see the lives of people in this community impacted by Jesus, we need to go deeper than just wanting signs and wonders and miracles. We need to be a bit like this early church. You want to see signs, wonders and miracles. And believe you me, I do. As much as anybody else want to see people who even walk past the church. And I, I, I see them every day where you can, you can see people who are struggling with, with, um, different burdens in their lives. How wonderful would it be if if they came into a revelation of Jesus? How, how wonderful would it be if, if our young people knew <clears throat> the power of God and, and that Jesus had a plan for their lives? And I'm talking across the community, you know, that the people who <clears throat> haven't heard the, the message of Jesus before, young people suddenly realized that there was a purpose for their lives how would it be that the people who are struggling with life inhibiting um, conditions or lifestyles that they, they, they could be brought into freedom because of this wonderful Jesus who still still heals and still performs miracles? How wonderful would it be 
if the people in the streets and the houses around where we live <clears throat> had an awe and a respect for God because they recognised the power of God at work. And if we're going to pray that way, and if we're going to pray that it would happen so that God will be glorified and his kingdom comes, then I believe those are the kind of prayers that God will be pleased to answer. Some people look back on this period in the Acts of, of the Apostles as like a golden age where God was moving in mighty power. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was. But the challenge for me is that it says in the Bible, and I don't think we can just sweep this away um, randomly, it says in the Bible that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that's true, which I believe it is, then maybe we should be praying for a manifestation of the Spirit of God that affects people now in this generation in a way that people were affected, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles and in the words of the Scriptures. That this generation would see and hear that Jesus is alive but not just so that we can sing hymns that Jesus is is alive which is a wonderful thing and praise and worship of God I'm, I'm there I'm on board but this rich feast of the gospel of Jesus Christ this table which God sets out before the world the bread of life and, and the water of life and, and all those analogies that Jesus uses, he, he, he is the vine, he is the bread of life, he is the water of life, he is the way, the truth and the life. All this rich fare which is set out on the table of the Lord, if you like, in terms of the gospel message. That it wouldn't just sit there, but it would be given away to the people that need it. And that our generosity as a church will be manifested in our generosity of sharing the love of Christ with everybody that we come across, anointed and empowered through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. I've heard some people refer to the Acts of the Apostles as, as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, I, I like to play detectives and I, and, and I notice things and one of the things I notice, just going to the end of the Acts of the Apostles, is this. And I don't know whether you've ever seen this yourselves. But it's at the very end, chapter 28. Paul is waiting to come before Caesar, because he's appealed to Caesar. And um, eventually he will come before Caesar, he will be on trial, he will make his case. Before that happens, Paul in Rome has been visited by some of the elders of the Jewish community. He's explained to them about Jesus, the Messiah. Some of them have, uh, were so sure. Some of them wanted to come back and hear more about what Paul had to say. And so Paul gets visitors and with the limitations he has, um, I believe he was chained to a, a Roman guard. Um, with the limitations that he has, Anybody who comes to see him, he shares with them the good news of Jesus. And it says this, verse 30 of chapter 28. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly, there's that word again, boldly, um, and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. It ends. And, and, and my question, I don't know if you're anything like me, is, uh, and then what? And then what happens? And we read church history, and church history tells us that Paul and later on Peter were both um, individually martyred in the city of Rome 
for their testimony of Jesus Christ. And it looks to me as though the Acts of the Apostles, in one sense, in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't finished. Because I want to not add to the word of God, but I want to ask, so, so what happens next? What What's the next page in the story in terms of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? And I believe it refers back to chapter four. That the next stage of this journey is all those people who would come to faith in Jesus Christ through the faithful teaching of the apostles and the subsequent generations. And it includes us because the acts of the Holy Spirit are now. God is at work now. God has a purpose for our lives now. And Jesus is alive now. And with that, I invite you to join with me as we pray together. And so, Lord, the story continues, the adventure continues, the unfolding continues, but the Holy Spirit is the same. And so for the glory of Jesus, I ask that for every one of us, that you would fill us with the blessed Holy Spirit, that you would give us boldness to speak the word of God, that you, Lord, would, as it were, shake us as you shook that building and manifest your presence. In the name of Jesus, I pray that there would be miracles and signs and wonders and that the name of Jesus would be revered and honoured and that you would equip every one of us to be faithful to that story that you've given us in this great journey of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth, to the end of time, in every nation and in every generation. I pray, Father, that Jesus Christ will be glorified and honoured here in Blackpool. And so, Lord, start with us and do that work in our hearts this day. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord, our Saviour, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Amen. Well, thank you, folks. It's been good to be with you. I'm sure some of you will be watching this later and continue to pray because when we pray, things will happen. God bless you.